Hello, my name is Vicky Hayward and I'm chairman of Mountview. Welcome to Mountview Live, which is a series of conversations with the cream of the UK and the US musical theatre and theatre world. This series is for Mountview students, but it is also for wider audiences. We're very pleased that you can join us today. We're also joined by a selection of Mountview students who will be asking questions in a while. Welcome students. Today's guest is Stephen Dalbury. Stephen has been nominated and won a fistful of awards, including Olivier's, Tony's, BAFTA's, Drama Desks, Critic Circles and Emmys for Billy Elliot, both in theatre and in film, and Inspector Cools, The Inheritance, The Jungle, his film The Hours, his TV series The Crown, and Paterfamilias. And then, of course, just a little thing called the opening and closing ceremony at the Olympic Games, directed by Jan Danny Boyle and produced by Stephen. I first met Stephen Daldry in the early 1990s when he was artistic director of the Gate Theatre and I was executive director of the Contact Theatre in Manchester. He got the top job at the Royal Court as artistic director and I was lucky enough to join him and his team as executive director. The truth be told, we only understood about half of what we were doing at that time, particularly when we pulled down a large part of the theatre and rebuilt it as an early project of the brand new National Lottery Programme. However, we built a fantastic theatre together and produced over 100 productions in Sloan Square and the West End and on Broadway. It was a defining time for UK theatre. If you're the artistic director of the Royal Court, you need to find those plays that people will remember from your decade. And I think we can say Stephen safely did that. He found Shopping and Bucking by Mark Ravenhill. He found The Weir by Connor McPherson. He discovered the fantastic trilogy by Martin McDonough, which started with The Beauty Queen of Lanan. And he found Sarah Kane and her extraordinary play, Lasted. So welcome, Stephen. I remember, Thank you. <laughs> I remember when I was offered the job of executive director at the Royal Court, I rang up a friend of mine and I said, okay, so if I do this, what's it going to be like working with Stephen Dalbury? And they said, oh my goodness, it'll be the most fantastic roller coaster ride of your life. And there was a pause and I said, I don't do roller coasters. That's <laughs> not what I do. <laughs> And another little insight into your personality or your perceived personality, but I also remember when we were talking to the whole team at the Royal Court, and it must have been quite a tricky time. I can't remember what it was we were trying to convince them to do. But um, you said, remember, it's not the taking part, it's the winning. <laughs> <laughs> That's not any. Which finished me off completely. I think actually I can credit you with making me realise just how ambitious a person I really am. So I wanted to ask you really, what gave you that conviction to, to, to believe that you could succeed? Did you, did you always feel like that? Because you certainly well, well, have that about with you. Uh, I certainly don't feel I've got any conviction to succeed. Most of the time I feel I entirely fail. Um, and sometimes you get away with it, but most of the time it's, uh, it's, uh, if you, uh, what's it like? It's, uh, embracing your uh, inability is the, is embracing inability, uh, embracing compromise and understanding what you can't do as much as what you can do. I think that, uh, the only thing, the only thing I've always been interested in is things I don't know how to do. Uh, and I think that, um, that's always been a fascination for me. I've, you know how a lot of directors, they, they tend to repeat themselves. I'm, I work very hard as I get older, particularly not to repeat myself. So I constantly try to do things that I've got no idea how to do. And sometimes that works out and sometimes it doesn't. But um, I'd hate to be in a position where I'm repeating. So I constantly try to put myself in positions that, um, of experiences or projects that I have no idea what, what I'm doing. But you know you're really good at convincing others what they can do. I mean, I think that's a terrific skill that you have as a director and as an individual. You know, you're, you, you're, you're good at 
at, uh, you know, if you think of all the actors that you've worked with across the time, you've asked them to do some extraordinary risky things. So you must have that in you somewhere. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I think Peter Brook once said, to, once said um, the, somebody asked him whether, uh, what, what does it take to, you know, what was the question they asked Peter? I think it was, uh, they could, it was really hard to get a job. They were finding it as a director really hard to get a job. And did they have any, did he have any advice for them on how to get a job? And he said, the same skills that you need to persuade someone in a rehearsal room to do what you want are the same skills to get into a room in the first place. If you don't have the skills to get in the room, you certainly won't have the skills to be in the room anyway. So <laughs> the, the amount of work and uh, tenacity, determination you need to get in the room are the same skills you'll need in the room. Um, and if you can't get in the room, then you really shouldn't be a director. Uh, <laughs> but that's Peter Brook. I don't know whether we agree with that, but that's what Peter Brook said. And he's always right. He is. He is. He's also well known for his silences, which is probably not something you and I are very good at. <laughs> no. We just keep talking yeah. until we're told to shut up. So did you always know that you wanted to get into this world? Um, you know, were you born into a, into a theatre family? Did you... Did you my, mother, my mother was a musical artiste, so in some senses I was brought up in the wings of, of local theatres. But uh, um, I suppose at school, it's like all those stories, isn't it? There's always one teacher in one place that gets you to do something, and then I started directing at school. I sort of always knew I wanted to be a director. Mm -hmm. um, I went to drama school. I, did, uh, I would be, you know, went to join a circus, and I did lots of other things along the way. But I always knew they were in the service of wanting someday to be a director, and so in that sense, it was pretty single-minded, I suppose. But that came out of school. That came out of uh, Mike Robinson, was his name, uh, a school teacher, in fact, a German. He taught German at school, who did the, the school plays, and I suppose it's down to him. We've There's all, always a teacher. We've all got one. And then was there someone that helped you step up, you know, in that kind of classic moment when they went, yeah, this, this guy is a director, and I'm going to believe in him to direct that piece. Give no, I mean, I... And there's been mentors, all the way, and there still are mentors, actually, all the way through one's life. Uh, and they're, they're mentors, of, you know, there's teachers, you can call them teachers, but teachers are different stages of your life. So I've had them all the way through my life, and I still have them. I still nurture them, and still, um, I'm blessed to have them in my life. It's people, basically, uh, who can help you or advise you or nurture you or encourage you to a certain point. The, the, the sadness is, of course, you often outgrow them, uh, and then you need another one. Um, and it's actually keeping the teachers that, um, that you've sort of worked your way through or that you've outgrown, it's keeping them with you if you possibly can, rather than discarding them before you go on to the next one. So it's trying to keep that community of people who have helped you along the way close, because they no doubt will help you in, in the future as well. Um, but there's been many of them. But perhaps, I mean, and I, and I can talk about all of them, perhaps the most significant was a woman called Claire Venables, who, who ran the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. And I was in Sheffield at university, and then I formed a theatre company there, and then Claire Venables, who ran the Crucible, took me on board as an Arts Council Assistant Director. And uh, I spent many years with Claire, and her encouragement, I suppose, was pretty crucial, but so was many others, but I always looked to Claire as the turning point. It's funny, isn't it? Because I, I mean, I did a graduation speech to a group of students at Birmingham, and, and afterwards, people were coming up to me and saying, you know, but when, when's mine going to come along? And I said, well, that's the, <laughs> that's the hard bit, isn't it? You can't, you know, you can't make them arrive. But pretty much everybody I speak to who's over the age of 50 has at least one or several people who at some moment or another did something that changed the direction or made the path or showed the way or because life when you're looking at it from where we are backwards, looks like a plan. But of course, when you and I were living it, it didn't feel like a plan at all. It just felt like, you know, a series of wibbly wobbly paths that, as you said, you just take the next thing because it appeals to you in, in some way or another. But you, it's only when you look back at it, it looks like it's got a, a clear trajectory. That's exactly right. I mean, uh, that's exactly right. But I think searching for teachers, Maintaining them and knowing the importance and, and power they have in your life is, is important. And I still do it. I still, I still search. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really, really good point. Good note to me as well. Don't stop. Don't stop. <laughs> Keep looking for them. Keep um, looking. There are lots of questions coming up in a minute about uh, you know, directing and, and your creative motivation. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about something you, 
you've uh, broadened into because one of the reasons why we wanted to build this new school that we built for Mount View in Peckham in the way that we did and to have it as a place where artists can develop their work alongside students who can learn their craft alongside the community who can also in engage and develop their own creativity was because we had a very strong vision that we want our graduate students from Mount View to regard themselves as artist citizens, in other words, that they have a, a wider role than, uh, I say just, I don't mean it like that, but a wider role than performing on stage. Um, and, and I think things have changed in the profession in that I think many more uh, creative artists also see themselves wanting to engage with their local communities and the wider world in a, in a slightly different way than perhaps they did when you and I um, started out. And, you've increasingly involved yourself in areas of social justice and engaged that into your work, particularly refugees. So I wanted to talk about how that, how that had happened to you, you know, your, how you got involved with the jungle and, and how that's influenced your work. Um, do you know, I, I'm going to start this answer in a, in a slightly different way, you know, because a lot of young barriers say to, to me, um, you know, how do I, be, can you tell me, um, uh, how do I get, you know, how do I get to be a young director? You know, how do I become a director? You know, what, what? Um, and I said, well, what do you want to do? And they said, I want to be a director. You know, that's what I really want to do. I want to be a director. I said, well, well, oh, okay. Um, uh, why? You know, what do you, what, what do you want to say? What's, what's, the, what's, what's, what do you want to talk about? And he said, well, I don't know. Yeah, I just want to be a director. He said, that's the wrong way around, really. You, directing is irrelevant. Like the medium itself is, is irrelevant. It's only a medium to which you can talk about something. So it's, it's just, it doesn't matter whether it's film or TV or writing a book or drawing a picture or it doesn't matter what it is. It's just a, it's just a means by which you can have another conversation. So the actual form itself is of no real intrinsic value if you don't know what you want to be talking about. So the talk, what you want to say is much more important than how you say it. Um, and I, I say this because, of course, it's vital, you know, in the old days of drama training, it would be, you know, you'd, you'd never engage in that question. It would just be, you just wanted to be an actor. Why do you want to be an actor? Why do you just want to act? Yes. So the, the reason why you want to act, or the motivation for that, is, is never questioned or never brought up. But actually, it's the only question. It's like, what would you want to talk about? Now, it might be that you find, going forward, that there aren't the plays or the directors or the means or the theatres to enable you to have that conversation. But that's their fault, not yours. The most important thing is that you know what you want to be talking about. And then the theatre itself, the means by which it, that conversation happens will change if you're motiva motivated enough to have the conversation, whatever that conversation, what you, you, whatever it is. So uh, that's my introduction to this answer. The, the, long, the, the quick answer is the jungle, well, there was a huge, you know, there was in 2015, there was um, a million people were on the move in Europe. I mean, it was the, one of the great um migrations since the second world war and uh then they all ended up in calais so it seemed um it seemed ridiculous not to engage and so i know you know we started engaging and you know, i had a couple of friends uh called joe robertson and joe murphy who started going down there and then we decided in a in an absurd idea at the time to build a theater but when i say theaters it's it, another interesting point really what is a theater I suppose I call, we called it a theatre in Calais, in the refugee camp, migrant camp in Calais, because it felt like a provocation um, to call it a theatre. But actually, it was a t like all good theatres, it's a town hall. It's, it does everything. It should be a civic centre. So the advantage of this particular one that we built in Calais was that it was a place where anybody from any faith could go. It was a, it was a, it was a, the, the camp was quite segregated. In other words, the Kurds didn't speak to the, Iraqis, the Iraqis hated the Afghanis, the Afghanis, everybody was in conflict and segregated. So this was the only place really that everybody could come together and they did come together. Of course they came together to try to tell stories and in whatever means they felt they could tell stories. And Western narrative theatre making was on the whole irrelevant in that context. It was people had other ways of telling stories and then people started sharing the cultural mechanism of telling those stories together even without language or sometimes with language but it it also was a place of worship and a place of crisis and a place of celebration and a place of dance and poetry and a place to put the kids and a place just about for everything else which is what so in a sense i suppose the little dome theater we built in Calais is my idea my ideal version of what a theater should be it should be a civic center 
um, people should be engaged in the civic nature of that theatre as much as in the, the creation of art, because who knows what art is and who are we to say what art is. Um, anyway, that, that then continued. The theatre grew. It became, you know, obviously, I mean, the idea of a theatre in a refugee camp where people are desperate for water, food, shelter, medicine is absurd. But then you have to ask yourself, what is the nature, what is the, what is the value of art and what is the value of self-expression and what is the value of hope and what is the value of, of, um, of, a, of a collective idea of that group of people coming together? Um, perhaps the best way of describing it, I'm talking too much, I know, but you can edit this down. Mm -hmm. But one of, the one of the best ways of describing it is, I think that people, a lot of people who are refugees, what, what, they're, they're sort of in suspension, if you like. If, they, the past is, is terrible. There's, there's no future to be had, to be imagined, and all you have is the present. So one of the things that's been denied them more than anything else is narrative structure. In other words, where, where, where have I come from? It's terrible. Where where am I now? Where am I going? That narrative structure has been destroyed, and you're again, you're just in this suspension. So what the theatre can do is try to understand narrative structures, and so people can share stories and understanding and celebrations about the past, understand the misery of where they are at the moment, and in that find hope and actually find hope for a plan for the future. And of course, that relies on many other things as well, including legal action and changing government's point of views, but it actually in terms of on a human level, it's actually providing narrative into people's lives when the narrative has been uh, interrupted, subjugated or, or denied. That's a very intellectual argument, isn't it? Yeah, so I don't really it's, mean to... you know, it's really, really important. When I was doing um, the old fashioned idea of an Arts Council appraisal, where we used to come together and, and talk to people and advise the Arts Council about where they would give their money. And we used to uh, rock off into places and have those sort of conversations and I was, uh, we were appraising Nottingham Playhouse and we were meeting with a local headmaster of a school that the Playhouse had done a lot of work with. And um, I said, so, you know, could you just explain what the Playhouse means to you as a school? And he said, oh, that's quite simple. We tell the children, if ever they're on a trip with us into town, or in fact, if they're in town at the weekends with their parents and they get lost, they should go to the theatre because they'll be looked after there. And I thought that that's that's it. That's what that's what a theatre wants to be. And of course, it makes it so hard at the moment because we have these big things happening. We have, you know, COVID nineteen happening. We have the the, the crisis around the the, the the death of George Floyd and, and Black Lives Matters. And of course, theatre practitioners want to want to play their part in that, to be part of their community, and yet we're all kind of separated and, and, and kept apart at the moment. And we've been thinking at Mount View quite a lot about how we can engage and re-energize and work together collectively around the whole issue of Black Lives Matter. And you're sitting in New York talking to me now, so you'll have a very um, American perspective on this. I wondered if you'd been talking with, with other artists about about what change might look like, what, what you might want to do there? Well, yeah, it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very big question. It's a complicated question. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mindful of the fact that every time you ask uh, a white privileged male like myself what Black Lives mean, Black Lives Matter mean, or, or the, the first answer you get is a, is a very, you always have to go through about 10 minutes of self-justification. Mm -hmm. of defense self-justification or um uh i'm trying not to do that okay so yeah. i'm really trying not not to do that so so what what i'm trying to do on a personal level i think it's going to start with the personal is try to understand um what uh, systemic racism really means and just let's do it in, in my world do you know, what does it mean to walk into an audition room as a black person or black person or brown person or person of color and go to a, a group of people who are all white and you're trying to audition for them. What does it mean to go to a rehearsal room when you're, you or your mate are the only two black people in the rehearsal room and everyone else is white? What does it mean in a theatre where all the backstage staff are white? Mm -hmm. What does it mean if you tour and the challenge of touring is you're going to areas of the country where there, it's evident that the challenge itself is being in an Airbnb or a room that actually is not welcoming to you? How do you share that? What, what is the context? How do we understand the experience of black or people of color, black or brown people of color, 
what is their experience of being in the theatre in the first place? And just to understand that feels to me like a huge journey before we get on to the, 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 the sort of, as I say, sy systemic racism within the arts, both on the stage and in the audience and how we exclude people and what, is, what does inclusion really mean? So it's a very long, complicated question and one that I'm on personally trying to go on my own journey with. I think that in terms of the Back to Your Nottingham Playhouse analogy, I mean, I, one of the things I loved about Black Lives Matter here is that obviously there's a lot of very big and uh, important demonstrations happening. And there was this black intern, black boy intern, who was a well, very boy and a young, young, young man who was, who was at working at the New York Theatre Workshop, who, and the protests were going up on these village, and he just said, you know, why don't we open our doors to let them use the toilets? And of course, the theatre's going, no, we can't do that, obviously, you know, it's COVID, there's insurance issues, there's a million reasons why we said, so, no, I think we should open the door just to let them use the toilets. No, 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 it's going to be impossible with cleaning, COVID. No, no, I think I'm going to just open this fucking door, actually, and let them use the toilets. You can't do that. It's going to be, he opened the door and people started using the toilets. Within eight hours, every major theatre in New York City had opened the doors to let them use the toilets. I mean, I use it as an example because the one person <laughs> opens the door to let the people in. Now, what also happened within two days, they weren't just opening the toilets, they're actually opening the foyers to Wi-Fi. Yes, it's illegal. Yes, it, oh my God, you can't do that. Every theatre did it. And suddenly, the meetings started happening on the street, but they also started happening in the, in the theatre foyers. And of course, it, then it takes you two seconds to go, well, if you open the doors to the theatre, isn't that what a theatre, why are you just having these debates in the street? If you just open the fucking doors to the theatre, then the theatre itself would prove its own value because that's where the debate should be happening. And if we're not having those debates in the theatre, if we don't have that one person at the old theatre workshop opening the door, then I'm afraid the doors will become shut. So I think the, the, the sort of example for me there is all you have to do is open the doors and people will come in. They need to use the toilets and they need somewhere to use the Wi-Fi and they need somewhere to debate. Just open the doors. Brilliant. That's, yeah, exactly. And that kind of leads on to another bit of conversation about social engagement, access to power, access to money. So this interview is going to be going out on the same day that Mount View launches the Judy Dench Fund for Access to Drama Training, because Mount View does a lot to support its students um, in terms of fee waivers and bursaries and welfare support during their time with us. But we're really aware that uh, that can only increase, you know, particularly these difficult times, people might join the course and then find themselves, or their parents might find themselves in very different circumstances. We're going to go through a lot of social upheaval, I think, as a, as a result of COVID-19. Uh, and so we're launching this fund to raise money to help support those students during their time. Um, what would your advice to a drama school student who was graduating from Mount View right now and stepping out into the industry for the first time? How do you think it's going to be for them for the next few years in our industry? Do you mean as an actor or in other fields? Well, you can um, tell what an actor would do. Say again? Any field. Don't mind. Your choice. Well, you know, uh, representation backstage is very, very poor in the British theatre. It's, it's even worse in British film and television. So if you're trying to get anybody uh, black or of colour uh, behind the camera, it's incredibly difficult. The training programmes aren't there. It's even, it's worse than if you're an actor. I'm, I'm, it's just really, really bad. It's as bad as trying to get pe uh, people who run the institutions to be representative of the country they're living in. Because they, and a lot of these institutions, anyway, tend to be run by people who look a little bit like me. In other words, a white privileged male of a certain age tend to be right. And so that all has to change. I mean, the boards have to change. Um, the audience has to change. So everything's got to change and that'll, that'll take some time. I mean, in terms of immediate future, I think the, the situation will be catastrophic. That's the only thing I can say. I mean, the, the, I know the government are fighting hard, disorganised as they are and hopeless as they are, but fighting hard to try to create some sort of economic growth. And I think that's true here in New York as well. But the, this city, where I'm now in New York, is going to go through very hard times. And it, it's, there's nothing that one, I mean, it's just about the, the collapse of, in this city, New York, of tax revenue. I mean, they, the, the cuts are, come, are going to come and they're going to come hard. And that'll be true in London and it'll be true across the country as well. So. 
And the theatre, despite this recent um, rescue package from the government, the, um, it will retract. But I think that, that one shouldn't be too, I mean, it'll retract, there's no, it'll, it'll, it'll have to because uh, there won't be enough money to go around. Um, having said that, there's other opportunities that are still alive. I do think the streaming giants are still investing heavily. And I do think there's going to be as much, if not more work uh, in film and television. Uh, once we get the protocols and some treatments available, and those are coming along, I thought I would have thought next year things will ease up considerably. The theatre will take longer to recover because it always does. But I think in other areas of the industry, film, television particularly, I think that um, I think there is reasons to be optimistic. Stephen Jameson, who's the principal of Mount, he always gives students two pieces of advice, and I'm sure I'm not blowing his cover by saying them now. The first is make your own work. Don't wait. And the second is be on time. <laughs> and I think making your own work, not waiting. Um, you know, it's awful waiting for that phone to ring. Um, but in the meantime, be a creative person in your own right and make your own work. And as you just said just now, use the world that's around you uh, to feed the stories that you want to tell. I, I think yeah, I mean... The hardship with make your own work, which I agree with entirely, you know, and find coalitions and collaborations with people. And it doesn't have to be people who are currently in the business, but within the community or within arts groups or congregations, wherever you want to make those coalitions that make sense to you. The hard thing is how you sustain yourself financially. And yeah. sometimes you can't sustain yourself financially, given you, everyone says make your own work. You go, well, yeah, but I got to work. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that is possible and what the, and then it comes down to government policy about what is sustainable in terms of um, what we used to call the social security, but what's it called now? What do you, unemployment benefits, it's not even called that anymore. What, what do they call universal credit? I don't know what they call it. Some cr criminal, obviously appalling system they've come up with now. Uh, but it, so it is actually how, one, how you can sustain yourself financially and that's tough. That's going to get tougher as well. And I, I have no solutions to that except to try to insist as hard as you can uh, that this government starts uh, creating a universal credit that makes sense, which of course it doesn't at the moment. <laughs> we will turn them into activists. We should, uh, we should ask for some of their questions because uh, they're very, very important people as part of this. So let's move on to some of the student questions and I'm going to call out some names and, uh, and, um, and see what comes along. So um, I would like to ask Aviv to start, please. Hello. Hello. Um, so um, one of the questions, um, so in some of your stage productions, the ones that I was lucky enough to, to get to see, I felt that um, the stage concept, the design concept, was telling in and of itself a story that sometimes um, sort of extended beyond the action of the play and into our experience as an audience, so like the um, stage within a stage in The Inheritance and the sort of unfinished backdrop in The um, Inspector Calls. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your process in uh, crafting a stage concept and also how do you feel it may support the story, uh, I guess, in ways that are not necessarily sort of visibly perceptible or, or tangible or sort of analytical? Uh, oh, fucking hell. Well, first of all, there's no consistency to this answer. The answer I give you now is not the answer I would have given you five years ago, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago. So it changes, the answer changes. I mean, it's quite weird for me having some long running shows. Do you know what I mean? It's quite odd. So, when, like an Inspector Calls, I directed it when I was 29. Do you know I'm 60 now? So, of course, you, you go and see, it's still on. Do you know what I mean? So, you go and see it and you go, what the fuck was I thinking? Do you know what I mean? I just, that is obviously terrible. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. So, it, it, one tends to reject everything that one's done before. So, I can only tell you where I am at the moment. Um, at the moment, I, I sort of, I don't really, I'm sort of, um, where I am at the moment is, uh, I sort of don't really understand set design at the moment. I don't, I'm not really interested in stuff. So I'm trying to do stuff. I'm trying to do plays with nothing just because I don't really understand what I sort of, I, I suppose I, I used to do, I used to have a lot of stuff and now I'm trying to do it without any stuff. Um, 
Jocelyn Herbert, who was a very famous uh, Royal Court designer many years ago, who was uh, one of my teachers, uh, she always said, you know, uh, when she was alive, she used to go, well, you like to do a lot of stuff, don't you? Uh, you like a lot of stuff on stage. And so, um, but her basic premise was, you know, there, there's two sorts of designers, there's two sorts of directors, really. There, there's, there, there's designers who do decor, and they're not, they're, they're not very interesting, okay? They, they're just decor, yeah? And there's designers who design. There's directors that stage things, and there's some very good directors who are very good at staging things, but they're not really directors, they're stagers. And then there's directors. So it's how you, it's really, it's how you reveal what is, what does the story need? What does actually the story need to reveal the story? How do you get to the heart of the story and reveal it? Not to decorate it or decor it, nor to stage it, but how do you reveal it? So it's trying to, it's every, every play is different. And, and every time you approach a project, everything you learned last time is irrelevant. So everything is a dis disastrously difficult, torturous journey where you have to start from nothing and go, well, what do I need to tell? What does the story need? Or how do I reveal the story? So again, it's different on, on each one. Um, but at the moment, I'm into, I'm, into, I'm into trying to do stuff with nothing. No, trying, to, trying to get rid of the stuff to do nothing. I can reveal here that that 29-year-old Stephen Dory received a letter from the then executive director of the National Theatre informing him that, I think I'm right in saying, you'll stop me if I'm wrong here, they're informing him that he would not be able to have rain, the house would not be able to collapse, and there would not be children in the production. And isn't that interesting when you look at what then happened, that you managed somehow to, you know, convince everyone that, that it was right. And, and no boy was it right. Um, so there are well, moments you've got to fight. Yeah, but that, that, that wasn't really me convincing. I think they, they really, I think that they, the National, I was a bit of a, you know, um, arrogant young chap. So I think I was sticking to my guns and then I think they wanted to cancel it. They were, they were going to cancel the show. And uh, they just said, well, let's, do, let's not do it then. He's obviously an idiot. Let's not do it. And then um, Roger Chapman was this guy who was head of touring at the National at the time. He pre-booked this show to a touring schedule around the country. So he got like eight bookings. So he said, I can't cancel the booking. So they had to go ahead with the show. So I don't think they had any real interest in the show. It was too expensive and they thought it was nonsense. But unfortunately, they had to go ahead with it because it had a tour booked. So that's the only reason why the show went ahead is because they had a booking for a tour. I'm going to bring in Alana Gilbert now because um, her question is about truth. Alana. Hello. Um, Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, so the word truthful it feels as though it's become almost like a buzzword at the moment. You hear so many actors saying in their interviews that the best thing you can do is be truthful and so many directors will ask you to be truthful and more honest in their performance. But what are you actually asking someone to do when you say that? And what does a truthful performance mean to you? I don't really know is the honest answer. I, I think there's a, there's a, um, this, oh gosh, I think this is complicated again. I think there's a move towards authenticity, which is what people are really talking about. But they're not really talking about truth, they're talking about authenticity. And authenticity is the new byword for uh, all things good. And by authenticity, Authentic, they mean how does it speak to you? What is it? What is your personal experience of this? Everything is authentic. So you have, but I think it's just now that that tends to be, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying the, the notion of authenticity is, is crucial. And there's value to it. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not di I'm not dishing it. There's value to it. I mean, I think there's real value to it for um, uh, black, brown and people of color performers particularly because sometimes you can get into plays or situations where the, the, if, you're, if you are, for example, a black person on stage, then that, the fact that you're black is not registered or people don't acknowledge the fact that you're asked not to be authentic to the fact that you're a black performer on stage when it's actually evident that actually you are a black performer and that is denied in the, both in the context of the play, the staging or the way it's directed. So it, the, 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 
I mean, I'm learning this, but the, the consciousness of what you are, what you bring onto the stage authentically as you is, is, is important and can be important. And I do think that's real, particularly at a time what was happening and everything is a reaction against what happened before, of course. One before is, um, is this idea that character is something that you create. Do you mean it's something new that there's this character? I've, I've never really bought into the idea of character, by the way. Just as a, as a just to explain my, the, my basic, I've never really understood when people talk about character, I go, what the fuck are you talking about? Do you mean when people do backstories or all this, I go, well, I don't, I've no interest in any of that. Uh, character is determined by action. So what you do is what will determine the character. Do you know what I mean? And so when people have said to me in the past, oh, I don't think my character would do that, you go, well, A, it's not your character. Uh, B, um, change it, because uh, they're going to do that. Uh, let's do that now. So in my head, it's always been characters. De character is determined by action, as opposed to action determined by character. But if we're going to go intellectual, I think that's late Stavislansky, um, as opposed to early Stavislansky. But I think late Stavislansky understanding that uh, character is determined by action and bringing in this latest idea that you have to be authentic within that confuses it. But it might be interesting. I think there's dangers within the search for um, the so-called authentic performance. Um, uh, because I think that might ask some, uh, it's confusing to me, or I'm not saying, necessarily saying it's bad, but I'm saying this need, this urgency for authenticity can also be valuable and spurious at the same time. Elliot. Hello, Stephen, pleasure to meet Hello. you. Hello. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, as, as a director, how much does your process shift between working for stuff for stage and stuff for screen? And if there's a medium you personally prefer? Uh, well, yeah, well, hmm. uh, they're very different and they're the same, but they're very different. I mean, I'll tell you what the obvious differences are, okay? I mean, I know you know this, but they're quite instructive. Um, they're obvious. So the, the, sim the simplest, um, difference is uh is in the theater you've got to repeat the action it's, re it's about repeated action okay it's just that it's just that you're going to so the whole of your training is to do repeated action so it's not it's not about the moment of truth it's understanding how you get to the moment of truth and then you can repeat it so it looks authentic eight times a week so that's the basis of all what you're at drama school to do is to repeat and repeat truthfully or authentically whatever word you want to use but that's the idea of what you're doing in in it doesn't matter. You only got to do it once. Uh, which is, you don't need any training whatsoever. You just, just you, know, as a, you can have an approach that can be useful from your training, but actually, you don't. It's not necessarily. You don't actually have to repeat it in a way that is um, that you have to understand in order to repeat it. In other words, all sorts of other things can be played. So that's the biggest difference: repeated action. Um, the other difference is uh, cubic airspace. I love these. These are really, these are really good, aren't they? Uh, so repeated action, cubic airspace. So in the theatre, your cub the cubic airspace of whatever auditorium you're in will determine how you are going to play it. In other words, how you can communicate or bring along people at a great distance from you. Um, and how you are going to bring your storytelling to, how you're going to allow yourself as a storyteller to embrace that number of people that far away. In, uh, in cinema or in film and TV, the distance can be uh, four inches. So you don't need, it's about that, that cubic airspace is that, and the, and the cubic airspace at the Old Vic is whatever it is. So it's a different, it's, it's totally different depending on the cubic airspace. Um, for me as a director, the difference with theatre is that the great thing I love about theatre is that everybody understands what's going on. In other words, and so if you're in a rehearsal room, the people that are, on the whole, the people at the rehearsal room and the people who, are the same people that will go through the rehearsal, through the tech, and through the run, and then you finish your run, and that's it. Those, they tend to be the same people. Um, and so it's a collective act. And everybody knows whether it's good or not, really. I mean, really, you can fool yourself, going, oh, no, it's going to, oh, they're very brave, or, oh, I think it's going to be okay. But actually, if it's shit, you basically know when you're in shit, you know, you know, and you know when someone's terrible. But you just don't like saying it. In film and TV, you've got no idea. Because the only person that knows anything, the people you start with are certainly not the people you end with. 
So you've got a group who does pre-production, then you've got a group of people who do the shooting, then you've got another group of people who, and none of these groups stay with each other. Then you've got another group of people who do the editing, then you've got another people who do the mixing and the rest of it, then you've got another people who sell it to the audience. None of those, so the only person that's consistent with all those groups of people is you, as the director, so it's more lonely. Um, and on set, you can have 300 people on set, but actually no one knows what's going on. No one, is, it, is it going well? People say when they go, well, uh, we, we, you know, we got to lunch okay. I mean, they don't know. I mean, is it going well? The schedule's going well. Yes, but is it any good? I don't know. They've got no idea if it's any good. It could be absolute tosh, or it could be absolutely brilliant. Nobody on set has any idea. But again, in a rehearsal room, you basically know whether it's a, you're in a turkey or, or, or you're not. Um, so, uh, so uh, as a director, I find film, you know, as I say, on the, I try to keep, I try to upset that. So I try to keep people with me all the way through, if I possibly can, like the writers and the, you know, try to keep them with me. But it tends to be more lonely. It's more like a relay race, um, film and TV, where theatre is more, is more collaborative. And the other, oh, the other great difference is in theatre, if it's shit that night, it's okay, because you can have another go tomorrow. Do you mean you can do it again tomorrow? So even if you're watching something that's obviously terrible, you can go, I don't know, I can make that better by tomorrow. It's okay, it's okay. In film and TV, you just, for the rest of eternity, you're staring at your own mistakes, which is why I can't stand watching anything I've made on TV, because you're just going, well, that fucked up. I, should, I knew that was a bad idea at the time. I knew that was a terrible shot. I knew they were acting appallingly at that moment. And you're just, you're just staring at your own inadequacies for the, rest of, for the rest of history, which is very, very disconcerting. Yeah, now I understand something I never understood about why why watching yes film is so hard. I think Moni could build on this. Moni, are you? Hi, Stephen. Um, so I have a question actually about your upcoming production of Wicked, which I'm ridiculously overexcited for. Um, so, like in terms of actually transitioning it from a piece of musical theatre on stage into a feature-length film is it is it freer is there more freedom to that or is it because of the nature of film or is it actually more restrictive because obviously you have so much more that you can work with and play with in terms of the sets and the magic of everything well it, again the answer is both i hate to be irritating but, <laughs> um the first problem is the first thing you're gonna, one has to engage with him is it's three hours long uh, two hours fifty do you, can you make that two hours 50 musical in two hours? Can you cut 50 minutes out of it? Is that possible? And can it still hold? Sometimes you can. Okay. With Wicked, we're having difficulty with that because the story is so dense. So it's the story is so dense and complicated. It's unknown whether we can cut it down into a feasible length of movie for the audience that would watch it. Um, so one solution to that is, is and, and actually the story is in some areas underdeveloped. Is that the right fifth word for the, for the musical? It, it's, I don't want to be, I've got to be very careful what I say. Uh, <laughs> the story needs, uh, could do with more, un, we could understand more. It would be more interesting to know more of what the world is and what is actually going on, not just between the two girls, but the world and the wizard, and what actually is happening to the animals. And There's more things to understand. If you cut it down, which we tried, it feels a little bit um, one thing after another. Now, Tom Page has got a good follow on and Lee build on this about, about performances. Tom. Thank you, Vicky. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Hiya. Good. Um, so I wanted to ask, I'm a big uh, admirer of the film Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. Oh, uh, you're very sweet. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful depiction of a, a character possibly on the autistic spectrum. But I'm also interested in your, um, your approach to preparation for your actors in terms of how you respectfully um, prepare for um, a, a topic as kind of raw, I suppose, as the ones dealt with in the film to do with 9-11, autism, etc. Well, I mean, a lot of us, uh, I wasn't in New York during 9-11, uh, but my family was. My Sandra was in New York. A lot of the actors had direct experience of their own personal relationship to New York, either being here or family being here during 9-11. So everybody brought their own 
particular um, experience to the film, I suppose we formed a strong alliance with as a company of actors and as a, as a you know like a group of filmmakers um, with an organization called Tuesday's Children, which is one of the major organizations here in New York which still looks after um, children whose uh, parents were uh, or guardians whose parents were killed in the towers and but they've broadened out they don't just do 9-11 now they do uh, children of terrorism around the world in, in a variety of different conflicts so they, they're, they're a fantastic organization as well and I'm still very involved with them and they are they were very instrumental it's Tuesday children that were very instrumental in, in um, uh, in a collaboration, really, if you like, is that the best way of talking about it? About um, um, which informed every aspect of that production, really. I mean, we were very close to them and that group of people, um, which has, has formed a tie which has lasted sort of right the way through my life and, and, and now as well. Um, um, so uh, Tuesday Children were the, 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 the biggest, I mean, we had many other contacts, of course. I mean, many of us were, were uh, severely affected, um, or many of the cast were severely affected, lots of different ways for 9-11. Um, but it was Tuesday Children that was the major source of our connectivity, if you like, with the people who've been through it, and with particularly children who've been through it. Mm. Mm. Um, Ollie wanted to ask you about new work and revivals. Hi, Stephen. Um, I, yeah, I was just thinking about, because I, I think I've noticed a lot over the past few years, is with writers such as Pinter and Arthur Miller, uh, Tennessee Williams, you sort of see these plays being put on fairly often. And I sort of think, why do you think it is that as an industry of, of creatives that are incredibly focused on social justice and on change and representation and all of these things that this work's being churned out that undoubtedly has its place. But why, why is there not more focus on things like the inheritance of the jungle where lesser known, lesser told stories or more current affairs are being explored in the major West End theatres? Because I think it, I don't know, I just think there needs to be more of that than the, I mean, the older stuff is brilliant, but it's not the world we're living in now. The, uh, I, I'll give that question to my friend Sonia Friedman, who produces many of those shows. I'll say, I'll, I'll tell her that Ollie says you're just churning it out. Sonia would say, I'm not churning it out. The major re examinations of the major classical works of theatre uh, texts, which need to be re examined and re explored for a new generation and a new perspective by major artists who are willing to do so. That's, I'm sure, Sonia would say that, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I would probably in some form agree with that. But in terms of balance, um, in terms of, you know, uh, what is the balance there within new work? I don't, I mean, you'd have to ask them. Yeah. I mean, I can't really speak to Sonia. I, I got bored with the idea. I mean, but I can really speak personally. Like, you know, do I want to do the cherry orchard? I'm sure someone's going to, you know, I'd love the cherry orchard. I love going to see does do anybody's interested in my version of the cherry orchard? Am I interested in my version of the cherry orchard? Not really. Of all the things I could spend my time doing, do I want to do another fucking production of the cherry orchard? Not really. Um, but there's other people that do and will find it absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure, and uh, Chekhov is a wonderful person to be uh, spending many months with. And I'm sure um, that would be rewarding if you had the right take on it. But um, I think that the people who are doing the shows that you're referring to right now do not consider themselves doing heritage theatre. I think they're trying to reinvent mm. and explore and trying to do something that's alive and that is speaking for now. To be honest, I think that's mm. what they're doing. Yeah. You might not agree with that, that's what they're doing, but I think that's what they're trying to do. Um, um, the balance of new, I think there's a lot of people really, I mean, in, I think the balance has shifted towards new work. But maybe that's just me. Um, but I can see a huge interest in creating stories for now. And I think that's only going to get more potent as we move forward. So I've got great confidence that even if you're dismissive of heritage theatre, um, don't worry. I think that the wave of playwrights that is emerging is going to be strong and vocal and, and very brilliant. 
And actually audiences, when asked, say they want to see something new as much as they want to see something old. So sometimes I think we're encouraged to produce old because we think it's definitely going to sell, but actually the new one might well sell better. Um, and certainly when we were running the Royal Court, you know, there was no shortage of stuff going uh, into the West End. It, it, a lot of it is about investment, whether how much money those, those theatres, particularly outside London, have got the money to to fit into the new work, the riskier new work, or new work where you actually have to pay the royalties to a, to a writer may become the, um, the defining moment. Um, I think we've wrapped up all the other questions apart from one in, in the questions, but um, Holly has a question about the Olympics. Hello, so I would love Hello. to know more about directing something so large scale as the kind of opening and closing of the Olympic ceremony is like, how do you even start with something so huge and large scale as that? Yeah, just to be clear, I didn't, I didn't direct them, I, I produced. So uh, Danny Boyle uh, did the, the opening ceremony. Um, it, it's it, it's a, that my job was different. So I didn't really have to do the job that you're asking. My job was much more at a political level is making sure that the independence of those directors and those artists working on the opening ceremonies of the, of the primary Olympics and the Paralympics um, uh, as, and all ceremonies was what the artists wanted to create. That was really my job and to get them the money to do it. So I think that to be honest, you'd have to ask Danny that question. Um, uh, and he, I, he, Danny being, um, very uh, charming would probably uh, not go into the, 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 the difficulties he, he faced, which were considerable. And there was considerable uh, organization and political opposition that he had to go through. So it was not easy for him. Um, but uh, we, on, in a certain band of that producing, tried to uh, defend the artists as much as we could within a lot of... Um, national corporate and um olympic pressure to do other things is that the polite way of saying it that's very political of me isn't it i'm trying not to say anything too dodgy but uh they would have to answer that yes it's very very demanding because it's very 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 challenging and you don't know what you've got till you do it i mean i think danny would say that it was it was very um it was very very challenging i heard um, I don't know if she was the stage manager, the person that called. I mean, the idea that there is somebody who's actually calling that show as a stage manager, you know, going, okay, 10,000 bicycles and on, and, um, you know, green. Uh, and she was being interviewed. She's certainly done many Olympic ceremonies, whether she did, did uh, yours, and said that, you know, they said, but what happens when something goes wrong? And she said, well, that's really <coughs> because nobody knew that the 10,000 bicycles were about to come on. So if they never appear, it's fine. We just move on to the next thing. And I thought, oh, yeah, because we, none of us, I was actually walking into the uh, stadium for the opening ceremony and I texted Stephen and said, good luck. And he sent me a text back which said, it's shit, go home. <laughs> and I knew, <laughs> That it was brilliant. I, and, 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 and he must have known, and Danny must have known, and everybody must have known in that, in that space, just how much was resting on that. I mean, you know, the nation had all watched them. It was, was it China? Where yeah. Was, you know, we watched that See? and we thought, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And you did, you pulled it off. You, 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 you encapsulated national pride in a show, that's hard. The, the, one of the challenges was, uh, was simply transmission. And, and I'm, again, there's many stories about, about that period of time, but I'll give you one. The, the, traditionally speaking, the Olympic Broadcast Service, that's, a, that's a, its own television, it's got its own television service, okay? They film everything. And we said, no, we're not gonna, we don't wanna do that. We wanna film it ourselves. And that became a huge political nightmare between the IOC, the Olympic Broadcast Service, and us. In the end, we came to a compromise where we would film our sections that we wanted. And then when it came to protocol sections, we'd have to switch 
transmission to the Olympic broadcasting service, had their own cameras and their own means of doing it, their own, everything was, se was separated. And we'd have to keep switching between the two during the evening. The danger there was that the, 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 the switches from one system, it was a whole different system, to another system would break down. So what we did have was a series of alternative pre-recorded films <laughs> which we could go to in the in the in the event of a break in that transmission which we sit i mean i've still got them somewhere which we never had to go to the transmission never broke but we made huge we spent we spent a fortune on these other films um which uh, were never seen uh, sadly but one day i'll do a screening of all the films that were never seen in case there was a break in transmission my favorite one was that we did the most amazing projections all over the House of Commons, which was a really, really good, and um, millions we spent on this projection on the uh, House of Commons from the other side of the river, which lasted about three minutes on the assumption that we could get the transmission back up had it failed, and that people would have something interesting to watch with this uh, unbelievable projection show uh, over the House of Commons. Uh, but one day, maybe, <laughs> maybe, yes, I definitely would never let me show it. But there was many of those films that we had to make in case there was, as I say, break into transmission. Um, but you're right, Vicky, yeah. The bicycles don't come on, they don't know. Muhammad Ali can't make it up the stairs. He's not here. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. <laughs> that is, as they say, show business. <laughs> and why we all want to be in it. Stephen, thank you so much for such a, a, a brilliant uh, set of answers. Um, as ever, uh, you, you, you've done everything we would have wanted and um, I certainly have been inspired. I've learned things I haven't uh, even known about you and we go back a long way. Thank you very much. I think the tradition at this point, I hope, is that everybody switches on their sound and we can give you a round of applause because oh, that's all missing. We can't be in theatre at the moment. So we're going to say, let's just do it. Thank you, Thank you so much. I was very green. I didn't have any theatre background at all. No one I knew had ever been involved in this world, in the world of the arts and everything. And so I sort of assumed I couldn't be in it. I don't come from a wealthy background. I don't come from a place where I could finance myself to go through the training. Young people who want to have training have to take other work and other jobs. I think it's a huge strain on young people. I did a 13 hour shift every Saturday at a nursing agency. If you weren't born into it or didn't know about it, how do you get in? I just was willing to do anything to do this thing that I loved. <laughs> Peter Cox said, founded Mount View out of an experience he had during the army. In 1945, he was denied access to the officers' drama club, so he started his own drama club for the lesser ranks and then brought that back to London, whereby he established a theatre club in his own house. He wanted to have a theatre club, a um, um, place where people could come throughout the community and work on scenes and plays and songs and it was very much a community organization which then grew and grew and grew and grew. The Judy Dench Fund is singularly the most important thing for Mount View at the present time. We need artists from each and every area of our community to tell the stories that reflect contemporary life. We must be training people from every walk of life, from every culture and from every socio-economic background. I think it will help outreach to different communities and people of different backgrounds to give them an opportunity to really come to the forefront and really help further our industry. It's about creating opportunity and it's about creating access. It's investing in the arts for the future. You can concentrate on what you really, really want to concentrate on, which is rolling your sleeves up 
and learning your craft. It will just break the limitations of what has been potential and what has been possible before because we've got an array of voices, a diverse range of people really making the best of the best art. Talent doesn't discriminate. Training needs to be accessible for everyone. This fund at this time is the keystone to the future health of our industry. Thank you for supporting the Judy Dench Fund. It's one of the most rewarding things you'll ever do. Thank you.